is the Android Native Development Kit, so the NDK. Uh, so who in the room already have used the Android NDK before? Just raise your hand. Okay, some people still. So I'll cover the basics and also more than that. And um, even if you already have used the NDK, I think it's also good to cover the basics. <laughs> because the NDK is something not so easy to use and really easy to fail with. So I'll talk about the NDK, how to use it, how to properly support all the CPU architectures you can target, how to debug and optimize your NDK code, and we'll have some question and answers in the end. So the NDK. Uh, the NDK, it's a package of scripts and toolkits that allows you to compile C, C++, assembly, um, to native libraries that will run on Android. So they will be run through the JNI, the Java Native Interface. So the obvious reasons to use it first, maybe the performance. So if you have some complex algorithm that are uh, better to be uh, written in a low level way in C, C++ or assembly. If you want to use specific um, intrinsics, so specific um, CPU instructions, it's also good. You also need to use it. But performance is not always guaranteed but the complexity is always warranted. So uh, you need to think a lot about if you should really go the NDK path or not. And usually when you use the NDK, unless it's for a game, you would use it for a teeny part of your application, but a teeny, uh, the bottleneck of uh, the performance of your application. But the, most, uh, the biggest use case for using the NDK is also when you need to reuse uh, code source across platforms. So C and C++, I think, compiled for almost any platform I can think of. And we've got good open source or not libraries that exist for long, long times. And many of these are available on Android, like OpenCV, for example. And then it's a good reason to use the NDK. <coughs> if you're curious about uh, what other Android developers are, are using the NDK for, or if you just check by yourself whether your application is getting installed correctly along with uh, its .so files, so the NDK compiled libs. Uh, I've um, developed a small application called Native Lib Monitor. And you can find it on the store, of course. And since it's easy to do a short demo and it's interesting to see uh, what libraries people are using in, uh, in other applications, Let's have a look. So it's the application and the application that are installed on my emulator here. So games are quite obvious clients for NDK use, uh, but simple games uh, are, can be also written only in Java. For example, if you take 248, it doesn't have any libraries inside. But another version of 248 will use these. For example, Coco Studi. Coco Studi is a game engine uh, that you, is used ex exclusively from the NDK. Adobe Reader for decoding PDFs will also use it. Standard apps like Airbnb and others usually don't use it. And even if you would think some apps will, will need this, the browser, for example, by def the default one doesn't need it because it's using the web view from the system. Clash of Clans uh, using some. And even on the multimedia sites uh, like Deezer or Dailymotion, they don't use the NDK. But some of us, uh, like EDJing, for example, let me try to it. I don't have it installed, but some apps that will want really uh, low level access to APIs, like if you want low latency on Android, you need to use OpenSL uh, to handle sounds, and then you need to go the NDK way. Facebook, for example, uh, even if 
comparable applications wouldn't use VNDK. Facebook is using VNDK, actually, because they prefer to handle the memory of all the images loaded inside the application directly in C and C++. So they can just avoid being caught by the garbage collector because they need to manipulate themselves the memory of their objects, in this case, to reach better performance. And even if you don't use the, the NDK yourself, so compiling uh, sources, <coughs> C and C++ sources to, uh, to desktop files, if you rely on game engines like libjdx or others that you use directly in Java or other languages, in the end, you have .so files integrated in, into your application, and it's good to know what's happening under the hood, because these libs themselves are relying on the NDK. So to get the NDK, you just go to the Android developer website, and you can download it. So it's specific to your platform. <coughs> and it's usually an archive. And now, since the latest release, it's a self-extracting archive. So you can put this archive not too far from your SDK folder. And inside this archive, you've got the most important script is ndkbold. On Windows, you use ndkbold.cmd. This script is that allows you to compile your sources to a .so file, so a shared object library. That's this .so file that you will use from your Android application. It also contains so the old tool chain used by NDK Bolt, so you can cross-compile your sources for the different CPU architectures and Android API levels. You have access to different compilers, and very important here, the documentation and samples. Why very important here? Because it's all the documentation is simply inside this folder. It's not on the Android developer website. That means when you Google for something um, NDK related, you don't find the Android developer website. So it's a good idea to start first by looking inside this documentation because it's up to date. And the NDK is changing and getting fixes quite a lot. <coughs> So on the way you use the NDK, you, unless you're watching a game with everything custom, uh, you usually integrate it with a part of classic Android application written in Java. So usually you have your C and C++ code, you compile it using NDK builds, and NDK builds will use a make file that defines how your sources need to be compiled, and you mix with Java. So Mixing with Java means you will use the Java native interface. I'll talk a lot more about that after. And so from your Android application, all the Android SDK APIs, you access this from Java. And on the C and C++ side, all the APIs you have, it's not the usual Java APIs. What you use are NDK specific APIs. So everything regarding the UI, um, list views and so on, it has nothing to do with NDK APIs. You can have low-level access to sound, multimedia, sensors, codecs. That's for everything on the computation side. However, <coughs> from C and C++, usually you need to have access to some Java APIs, Java Android APIs, like getting uh, the path to the external storage directory, for example. That's not a directly NDK API, but you need to uh, call the Android SDK for that. So JNI, you will use it in both ways. So both for loading your library and using it from your Android application in Java, and to make Java calls to the SDK from your C and C++. <coughs> so putting this in a different picture, Whatever application you are writing, it's still a Java application. In the sense, it will be run by uh, the Dalvik or Art runtime on Android. Even if you write almost 100% of your app in C and C++, it will still be run by the virtual machine or runtime. So you don't go outside of the sandbox or anything like that. And even if you write some 100% of your application in C++, 
you will use Java Android SDK APIs for JNI, either by including Android App Native Glue for those who know that. <coughs> and so even if you don't have any Java sources in your application, it's still run by Java. <coughs> so NDK build is, is the standard, is the central build script from the NDK. When you use it to compile your C and C++ sources into .so files, and then you integrate these .so files into your application project, and from your Java, you will load these .so files, so you'll be able to use these. So inside these .so files, you'll have the implementation of, your, of the methods you want to be native. Um, on cross-platform compatibility and reusing some existing code, um, you need to know that on Android, you don't exactly have a fully standard C library. So you have the Bionic C library that has been thought to be lighter uh, than standard C library. It's more for embedded world, but on another way, it's not POSIX compliant. It's lacking some uh, functions, like for a long time it was lacking uh, pthread cancel. You don't have <coughs> um, shared memory segments or anything like that. You need to rely on some over Android uh, ways to do that. So even if you have a Linux, uh, dot, uh, a .so file compiled for Linux and so on, you usually need to recompile your sources if you want to use it on Android. On the C++ side, by default, you have access to almost nothing. That means you can do objects, <laughs> but not much more. But by default, you can use other uh, libs that are part of the NDK to have more, like C++ exceptions, the STL library, and RTTI support. You have several choices. Uh, it depends on what part of the STL do you want, especially if you want to develop in C++11. Some parts, some libs support it better than others and also on the licensing uh, part. So some are GPL version 2, some of us aren't. <coughs> and to use this, we'll see later how the make files work, but you need to set which uh, library you want to use in the app STL variable inside the application.mk folder, no, file. And you can use all these in two flavors, either static or shared. Shared means you have another .so file you load for this library, and static means you want to integrate the feature of these libs inside one on only one .so file. That will be yours. <coughs> so to use the NDK and the NDK build script, so at the root of your Android project, you create a folder called JNI, and inside this JNI folder, you put your sources and the make file. The make file has to be named android.mk. And then when you call NDK build at the root of your Android project, it will compile uh, the .so files. To declare that <coughs> some methods will be implemented in C or C++, you need to um, specify that any method from your Java codes any method declaration from your Java code, you put the native keyword in front of it. So when you put the native keyword, it means the implement implementation will not be in Java, it will be uh, from a native library. And then, so uh, the actual method from Java and its implementation can be mapped. You need to load this library when your class is loaded. So in the static block, you do system.loadLibrary and the name of your library. The name of your library without lib or .so. Uh, these will be added automatically. So, <coughs> to recapitulate, so when you load your Java class, it executes the static block, load the native library. The native library can have an entry point that will be called at this time, called JNI onload. So, once the native library is loaded, the Java class is loaded, and later, when you call the method that has been set declared as native, your Java code will execute and execute the native method, so directly execute its native implementation and then continue to Java. So there is no threading or anything uh, implied when you do such thing. 
and at the end of the execution of your native implementation, it returns straight to the <coughs> Java code. Throwing any Java exceptions if there are some have been thrown uh, during the run time of your native code. So here's an example where you can see both <coughs> the declaration of uh, inside the Java, where string from GNI is taking no argument and returning a string, and it has been declared, declared native. And in the C file, you can see the implementation. So here the implementation will be mapped by default because it's following the GNI convention on the prototype. So it's returning a J string, that's a Java string, that's what we expect. And then the name starting by Java, because it's following the GNI convention. Then the package name with dashes instead of slashes. Then the name of a class where your string from GNI method has been declared as native. And finally, the name of a method, string from GNI. As arguments, it's taking GNI environment and J objects. So all the GNI implemented functions always take GNI env and J object or J class. It will take J object if your native method is uh, <coughs> to be used on an object, and J class if your method is, in, is static. So don't take an object, but only a class. <coughs> so here the implementation of a method of a method is very simple. It's calling new string UTF on JNN to create a Java string that contains hello from JNI. So regarding all the Java objects you manipulate, everything you, you uh, create, you do it using the JNI env. So the JNI event is the JNI environment. And that's the JNI environment you're asking to creating Java objects. So they will be created <coughs> by the Java runtime. So you can see this uh, method prototype is, can, be, can lead to quite errors when you do refactoring and so on. What you can do is use uh, Java H to automatically generate these prototypes by reading the class files that contains the native uh, declared methods. So using Java H, so part of the Java development kit, <coughs> you can generate automatically the prototype. So it would directly gives you this. So now on the make files, because now you get the content of a Java source file, out of the uh, C source file. <coughs> the only remaining piece you need to understand is the make file. <coughs> so the main, main make file is called android.mk. And the minimum content it needs to include are these four lines. So include clearverse, that's calling the NDK macro that will clear all the NDK defined variable. Then local module, that defines the name of your library. So if you here you name it hello GNI, the library that will be generated when you call NDK builds will be lib hello GNI dot so. And local SRC files, the list of the source files that needs to be compiled. And finally, the build shared library ma macro from the NDK. That will indicate the NDK that it needs to compile your source files as a shared library, so as a .so file. <coughs> you can adjust and modify it by using over macros and uh, variables. So for example, you can build a static library, so a library that will be reused by another NDK project, but not direct to be integrated uh, into an application. <coughs> you can also declare a pre-built shared library or a pre-built static library for indicate your toolchain that your library relies on some others that are either shared or static. If you use the pre-built libraries, instead of a C and C++ SRC source files, you will have an over .so file or a .a file. So that A is like .so, but for static instead of for shared object libraries. <coughs> a second make file you have is application.mk. Application.mk is, uh, isn't mandatory to have, 
but it's really important here to define some variables that concerns the all uh, your all application for the compilation of your library. <coughs> and inside the application at MK, you don't declare uh, any, you don't use any ma macro. Uh, you will not ask the NDK to do anything different, <coughs> anything specific. But that's here that you tune uh, application-wide variables. The most important variable to tune uh, is app platform. So app platform defines against which headers of Android you are compiling against. So it's uh, in some way the API level, the mean as the API level of your application. By default, uh, it's the latest one. And that can be problematic because you don't have backward compatibility when you do that. So if you <coughs> use the NDK, the latest NDK, and you don't have any settings anywhere, and you compile your source files, it will use the Lollipop headers. And it may lead to big crashes on former platforms. <coughs> so the best is to keep it the same as your min SDK version from your Android application. The other important setting is App ABI. App ABI defines against which ar architectures you are compiling your sources. <coughs> so I recommend, recommend setting it to all. So when you set it to all, it will compile to all the available ABIs from the NDK. Right, right now there are seven of them. So ARMY ABI for ARMV5, ARMY ABI V7A, X86, X86-64, ARMV8-64, and MIPS and MIPS-64. <coughs> Also, uh, NDK toolchain version indicates which version of GCC or Slang you, you want to uh, use. By default, it's uh, still GCC 4.6, and the performance has been greatly improved with latest versions. So I recommend se also setting it to 4.8. So I mentioned GNI several times. You know how to automatically map a method to its C implementation. <coughs> You also know, I've seen how to create a string, so asking the JNI environment to create a string for you. So when you work with JNI, <coughs> you work with um, Java specific types that are cross-platform. So for example, you have primitive types, so from Boolean to uh, double and uh, over elements, and <coughs> The Java defined version of these starts with a J and has a fixed size, of course, because this part is portable. So when your Java method is re receiving an int as an argument, you need to handle it as a J int on the implementation side. And for the objects, so <coughs> all of them are J objects. What you manipulate in reality is a reference uh, to the objects uh, within the JVM. You don't have direct access to the memory of the object. <coughs> and J object can be classes, strings, ar array, and throwable. Throwable is for the exceptions. So you remember how we created a string before? Yeah, there is a small difference to see here between when you use JNI from C or from C++. <coughs> from C, the JNI env you're getting is not an object, you're in C. So you call um, methods this way, uh, and you need to pass again the environment as the first argument of the method you're calling. In C++, you don't have the need for that, so it's JNI env is directly an object, and you can call methods on it without giving, again, the environment to it. Also, everything you ask the JNI and to create, you'll get a local reference to the object. <coughs> everything you get from JNI and, in fact, is local reference. A local reference means that the object will not be garbage collected because you are using it. That's cool. But that also means that once your native implementation has finished and the flow is returning to the Java execution, the local reference will be deleted because it's local, and the garbage collector will be able to get <coughs> to, to clean your objects. 
that is then it's important, for example, if you create strings inside the for, uh, for loop, you must absolutely uh, call manually delete local ref as soon as possible because you're limited in the number of local references you can have to objects. It, it costs to have local references to objects from uh, your native side. So again, when you get a reference to an object from Java, it's a local. If you want to use it across calls, you can still create a global reference on it by calling new global ref. <coughs> to get access to memory from your Java objects, uh, you have other calls. Here for a string, you can um, get a string region or directly get the string cars. For all the types we've, saw, we've seen before, you have a choice between getting directly the uh, elements or the objects and then it will sometimes give you a copy, sometimes not. So you shouldn't need to have modifications to do on it. And if you absolutely need a copy, you can do a region call. So you can get your object region and then you're sure it will be a copy and there will be only one copy. So on the performance side is better. Also, if you're working with strings, <coughs> so strings in Java, they are UTF. You can have null characters in the middle of a string, but string in C and C++, if you've got a null character in the middle of a string, that's not the middle of a string anymore. That's the end of your string. So you shouldn't use uh, functions like string length from C. You need to use, uh, you need to use Java to ask with Genion what's the length of the string originally. So you can use get string UTF length. It's important. <coughs> Generally, to call any uh, Java method from your C and C++, that's quite awful to do, but you need to do this. So it's in several steps. It's a bit like if you know uh, and already have used reflection on Java. So you need to progressively first get the reference to the class, then to the method, and finally you can call the method. To get the reference to the method, you need to uh, put in parameters a specific string. So here you can see the three dots in parentheses and the three other dots. That's called the JVM signature. That's uh, a short definition of what the method in Java takes as arguments and returns. So the arguments are inside the parentheses and the return value is uh, just outside. So it's D for integer and so on. And I know first time you will not know this by heart. So it's not written there, but you can get directly these method signatures by using Java P. So you remember Java H you used for generating the prototype. You can use it the exact same way for Java P that will return the method signature of everything implemented on your Java side. Or you can look at the JNI documentation. By the way, the JNI Java native interface, that's not something that has been invented with Android. Uh, that's something that existed long before uh, with standard Java. And all these conventions uh, still haven't changed either. When you deal about with exceptions, uh, you need to understand that there is no one-one mapping between C++ exceptions and Java exceptions. <clears throat> if you follow C++ exceptions and you don't catch it anywhere, your application will just crash and no Java exception will have time to, to emerge. <clears throat> so every uh, Java exception that happens during your native implementation, uh, <coughs> runtime needs to be handled by you. So you can do this by calling exception uh, occurred to get the exception if there is some. And if there is some, you can deal with it and call exception clear. If you don't do that, when your native code uh, finish running, the Java exception that was pending will uh, be thrown to the, the caller in Java. And so all the new exceptions that happens in C++, <coughs> you, can, you should catch these and throw a proper Java exception instead, a clean or your uh, 
everything that wasn't clean. So you can properly return to the Java execution. To throw new exceptions, that's uh, easier than calling any Java method because you have throw new method or JNI and so you directly pass the class of your exception, the arguments, and uh, that's it. When you call throw new, it will not stop the execution of your C or C++. <coughs> like for any other exception, it will wait for the end of your native code execution. So that gives you enough time to deallocate any objects and uh, reference to, to other system parts you, you need to clean before returning to the Java exception especially the <laughs> global references that may last between threads. So on CPU architectures, <clears throat> when you set app ABI to all, as I said it compiles usually <clears throat> for all the different architectures. So by default it compiles uh, everything under the libs folder of your application under a folder named by the architecture you're compiling for. So ARMY ABI, ARMY ABI V7A, x86, and so on. Generating the .so file there. When you package this, uh, so all the libs that are uh, inside the libs folder got packaged into your APK and are under the lib folder followed by the name of the architecture. So all the various .so files are inside your only one APK. If your APK, uh, if you want to gain uh, weight uh, for your APK and have it smaller, <coughs> you can have one APK per CPU architecture. So you don't need to republish your application under a new package name or any weird and wrong stuff uh, like that. <coughs> you can directly go to your console and upload more than one APK for your own application. You just need to uh, send APK with different libs inside and a different version code number. You need to follow a convention for the f a version code number because what the Play Store is doing is it gives you only one APK. It doesn't give you a choice between different APKs when you download an app. It gives you the APK that is compatible with your device, your device and that has the higher version code, like for handling any upgrades of your application. And on x86 devices, for example, x86 devices support both ARMv7, ARMv5 APKs and also x86 APKs, of course. <clears throat> so if the higher version code is for the ARM one, it will get the ARM APK. So you need the higher version code to be the x86 or x86 64 one. You can generate uh, multiple APKs for each CPU architectures with a proper version code really easily uh, if you're using Gradle. So it it's, uh, fits on one slide to, to do this perfectly using the ABI splits feature. So you just compile your application once and it will split your APK bit in uh, all the, um, for the, all the CPU architectures you declare. You've got the same feature for densities, but that's not the topic of the talk. And you, here at the bottom of the slide, that's where you define the right version code uh, depending on the architecture. So once you have one APK per architecture, so you just go on the store, you switch to advanced mode and upload all your APKs. So you'll have a list like, like this one, stating again what's the version code of the application you've sent, the native platform it's for, it's, that's the difference between the APKs. And in any case, you'll have some warnings uh, telling you again that the higher version code APKs will be installed on the device. So when you compile for uh, several CPU architectures, you need to handle this. Uh, luckily, we have uh, we have x86 devices on the market for more than two years, so most of the game engines, third-party libraries, and so on are compatible also with x86. Sometimes it's just a matter of adjusting app ABI to all, or x86 army ABI, and so on. If you need to have different code paths uh, inside your code, you can uh, you have compiler macro macros to do this at uh, compile time, and you can also include various files depending on uh, inside your make file. So by using the target arc ABI variable that will contain the ABI you're compiling against right now. 
So if you look at the samples, you have different methods. So LOGNI is the approximately the one I've described uh, in this talk. If you want to go further and have all of your code in C and C++, you can look into the native activity or the teapot example inside the uh, NDK archive. <coughs> it's showing um, how to get an OpenGL context and then you can do everything from there in C and C++, even accessing sensors natively. Another thing you can do, uh, instead of relying on the um, JNI mapping, so on the JNI convention for having the prototype of your methods in C with a Java, com, and so on, you can use whatever name you want, and then you do manu manually the mapping during the JNI onload. So I've said before, JNI onload is the entry point of your native library. So when you load your native library, JNI onload is called. And in this spot, you can manually register your C and C++ implementations. So you'll have the slides later, so, so you can try this, because we don't have much time remaining. <coughs> but you, can, you use it, you do this by uh, using, uh, again, the signatures of the methods using Java P, I mentioned before. So we have the command line that works. <coughs> then a table of your methods with the method name, the signature, and the real pointer to the function definition. And then here is a sample GNI onload method you can directly copy and pass into your project. <coughs> that will just uh, get access to your class and call register natives to give the table the array of methods we defined before. So they are registered to the JVM. To improve the performance of your native codes, uh, you can do stuff that usually are not accessible from Java, like using vectorization. So in a restricted number of CPU cycles, you can execute the same operation on different data. <coughs> so that's called vectorization. On Intel platforms, it's called uh, SSE. And on ARM, it's called NEON. You can achieve both uh, using compiler auto vectorization features if you activate the right compiler flags, or you can write yourself um, the SMV or the compiler intrinsics, which is com more complicated. But in any case, for the compiler flags, you can put this in your Android.nk. <coughs> so I give this for, for 32 bit and 64 bit Intel platforms with uh, <coughs> SSE activated. So you can debug na native code using GDB, either when running on ARM or x86 platforms. You can do such uh, from Eclipse. You can also print, so using Android log.h, that gives you direct access to the logcat. So to access to the logcat, you use Android log print, but usually you define the macro such loggy here <coughs> to use it like printf. So to use it from Eclipse, uh, when uh, you can just debug as Android native application. Sometimes the setup is not that obvious because um, <coughs> you need to generate a debug build of your application. You generate a debug build by using NDK debug and app optim variables. They are not automatically set from Eclipse when you do that. So quick question, who in the room is using Android Studio and not Eclipse? Not many, still. So Android Studio doesn't support uh, editing C and C++ code with uh, code completion, and, but that doesn't mean it's not compatible with the NDK. So by default, if you have a JNI folder with source files in inside, it will not use the android.mk files and so on, but it will generate automatically one that's working, <coughs> and it will generate .so files for all the architectures directly. You have very little configuration you can do on this. So if you have a simple uh, NDK side, that's fine. You can change the module name, add some uh, libs uh, dependencies from the system, tune the C flags, and uh, uh, adjust which STL library you want to use. 
If you want to go further, it's better to deactivate these features. You can know more uh, from my blog article on, uh, on, my, on ph0b.com. And if you already have compiled your NDK uh, native library, it's really easy to integrate. You just put your files inside the JNI libs folder. But on the Eclipse, it was on the libs folder. Here, it's JNI libs. So that's really important. And then you can share your uh, module as a uh, .ar library instead of a .jar. So the native libra libraries are correctly handled. So I already said this, for, uh, but it's really important. The Android platforms must be the same as your mini SDK level. So app, app, app platform must be the same as your minimum SDK level. And you need to test your NDK side on uh, L, or at least on ART, because JNI is uh, strict than, stricter than before. So before, sometimes when you do mapping, but half incorrect methods are missing on the side and so on, it was still working. But now it's not working anymore. It's firing its exceptions and so on. So you need to test. And that's it. I'm not sure we have time for questions. OK. So any question? I know the NDK is maybe not the easiest topic to handle, so I think you're still processing some information. But no, no worries, I, I guess you'll get the slides. Um, I'll put this on SlideShare or, or the organizers. But anyway, thanks for listening.